to do is better on this time. I'm not quite sure why there was a feedback loop happening before, but hopefully we've, we've fixed it just by uh, doing the good old switch it off and on again. So please let us know if everything's okay. It's sounding okay on my side. Hopefully it's sounding okay on, on your side. Have we got people coming into this stream, Spence? Yeah, people that seem to be finding their way across. Perfect. Um, let us know in the chat if the audio sounds okay now. Um, let us know where you're based, all those nice things. It's good to be back on the live stream with you, Rich. Yeah, brilliant. Cheers, Spence. Nothing like a, a good old one to, to, to start us off again with some problems. What right, everyone, let, let's go straight for it. So, if we jump back into the design space, some of you may have remembered this feature, um, this fixture from before. So this was looking at doing some, some traction rails for a mountain bike pedal. Um, Pembury's on the call. Pembury is the, uh, the company that we're doing this with. And I said last time that I wasn't happy with the design. So you can see here that I've changed the design ever so slightly to stop over constraining the, the part as well. So we're going to look at making this today. So let's jump into our manufacture space. Um, I've put some toolpaths on, but I'll be starting from scratch. We'll be looking at it. We'll be going onto the machine. We'll be seeing on there. So first thing I need to think about is how am I going to hold this? Where am I going to run my datums? And then what toolpaths am I going to put on each operation? So for those of you that have seen the live streams before, you know that we use Lang systems here in our workshop. There's lots of other clamping systems, but you tend to find people specialize in one just to make sure that they've got um, all the equipment around them. They don't have to keep swapping base plates and so on. Okay, so what I decided to do for our OP10 fixture was hold it like this. So I've got our vice underneath holding on a small bit of stock on the sides and I'm going to machine the top face, machine these holes in the bottom which will act as datum holes with some little studs that we put in and then they flip down onto the Lang zero point system. So that's what I've got here, I've set all that up. So let's see how I did that. I'm going to collapse those setups, I'm going to turn on um, all of the components and all of the bodies. And you'll see everything there that's, that's visible. So there's everything visible. And I'm going to talk through some of the basic settings that we need to do to try and make sure that our CAM workspace is as clutter-free as possible. So I'm going to create a new setup. And you can see what it does is it actually thinks everything in the CAD screen now is meant to be machined, but we know it's not. So sometimes the most important thing to do is actually select the model first and then the fixture before selecting the datums. But we can argue about that all day long. So I've selected the model. I'm now gonna select my fixture components, which are these jaws, the base, um, the feet as well, um, the little studs, and that center screw as well there. So I've selected my model, I've selected my fixture, and now I'm going to select my coordinate system. So my Z is at the top and my X runs along here. I'm just gonna flip the X because that's how I can see it on my machine. We're now going to look at the stock. I've got a fixed size block of material. It's 400 by 155 by 50. I think it's 50. Let's go have a look, everyone. So we've got the block of machine, block of material in the machine, and yeah, 50. Perfect. So 50 millimeters. Of course, if I got that wrong, we'd uh, potentially be crashing our tools. So best make sure we get that right. What we're going to see here now, though, is the visibility of the items change. We've got none of the fixture components in the bottom. That base plate has disappeared from the top. And that is because I've got something here that's called sync visibility with active setup. So it does exactly what it says on the tin. Whatever you've selected to be your model and your fixtures, it's going to make sure that those then are all that's visible on the CAD screen. This is a brilliant tool, so you'd have to keep going and turning visibility off and on all the time. Because then when we come to do our OP20, let's have a quick look, let's make a new setup there. Let's turn everything on again. And then we do when we do our OP20 setup in a minute, we're gonna choose our model as that model, our fixture as that base plate, and you'll see now everything else gets turned off. So a really nice tool, sync visibility with active setup. And what it will do as well is when I click between the setups, you see it will change. There's another tool that's the sync view with active setup. And that will also put you in a nice ISO view with Z pointing up. 
Again, sometimes that can get a bit distracting. I tend to leave that off. You might want to leave it on, whatever you prefer. But brilliant tools, make sure you use them. We don't put these tools in for fun, do we, Spence? We actually want people to be using them out there. Absolutely. I use the uh, the, the Sync View with Active Setup quite a lot, um, especially if you've got two two fixtures, one on each side. It, it, it frees up the space. I don't think a lot of people know that they're there, so that's a good thing to point out for sure. Yeah, perfect. I know, actually, I had a customer recently that says, why does it keep putting into an ISO view all the time? I was like, because you've got that turned on. Ah, brilliant, let's turn that off. So people might want it on, people might not, each to their own, but the tools are there for you to use. Is everyone happy on this live stream, Spence? Have they forgiven us for the audio issues at the start? I believe so. I believe so. We're all good. We've got Stuart, Pembry's here, Andrew, Benny, Marco, all joining on. So, uh, um, welcome everybody. Hi, Mike as well. Mike from Ontario. Oh, thanks for, yeah. thanks for joining, up. everybody. Right, let's get straight into these toolpaths. So, first thing I'm going to do, facing ops. I love some facing ops. So, we're going to face the top. Um, tool 19 is my face mill uh, in our house. So it's already selected it for me, but just so you can see, this is our tool library in our house. T19 is our 50 mil face mill. Now, I love parameters as much as I love facing ops. So what I've got here is some parameters that I set up for my personal preferences. So pass extension. Let's quickly have a look at the expression I've got here. I've got half of my tool diameter to give me my tool radius, and then times that by 1.2 to give me an extra 20%. So basically, it's 120% um, of my tool radius. That's what my expression is there. And why do I do that as a pass extension? Well, let me show you. When we've got our facing up going across the top of our pipe here, if we simulate this, what we're going to see as we drag our cutter across is, let's have a quick look here, down from the top. Let's turn our whole tool path on. And you see that green portion there? You see how quickly it swings around? Do you see that one, Spence? How quickly it swings around that green portion? I did. So that's because that is the linking move between those blue passes. So what that pass extension does is make sure you fully exit the material by the tool radius plus the 10%. Let's just change that to flute, actually. There we go. Plus that 20%. And then it does that really quick swinging round move and then engages back at that feed rate before. So really nice tip to make sure that it doesn't do that swinging linking move and ramp back into your material and hit it hard. Because we all know that the same as uh, why you've got differentials on a vehicle is the outside moves a lot quicker than the inside. So imagine how quick the surface speed is here really quick so I want to make sure that I've got out of that sort of that weird motion that swinging motion before I re-engage the material that's what I've got there facing going around coming back and going all the way across our part hopefully that was a nice top tip there I'm going to try and pack this with as many top tips as I can um, and we're going to go from there how are we doing for time we're all right we've got 15 minutes in so far how are we looking Spence everyone happy everyone's happy there's not much action on the chat today uh, don't know whether everyone's uh, still asleep or, or what, but let's let's have it in the chat. Um, what, what have you been doing with Fusion this week? What, what, what have you been making? What have you been designing? Let us hear in the chat. Cool. Everyone, please, these, these live streams are as good as we all make it, so let's, let's have as much interaction as we can. So, right, what am I thinking about now? I've just done the facing up at the top. Let's do... Let's, Let's do the outside. So I've now got to make a decision. I've got to make this complete fixture. And how do I attack it from both sides? The problem you get is every time you relocate a part, so you take it from op 10, flip it over, put it down to op 20, you will get a mismatch. It will be, depending on how much attention you put and how accurate you make it, it will be microns or millimeters, but there will be a mismatch. The trick is, is how to hide that mismatch and do it well. So what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to actually only mill down to the bottom of this chamfer. I'm then going to put the chamfer in. And then what's going to happen is when I flip it over, any mismatch 
will get lost in the transition of that chamfer to the outer edge. I hope that made sense. Because the reason why I can't mill it all in the last, in, sorry, in the second op, is if we have a quick look here at what we've got. We've got my fixture plate there. And these Lang base plates are far too expensive for me to have my end mill cutter scrape the bottom of it. So I need to give myself a little bit of clearance. But if I was to mill up to halfway, you'd have that step where the two M, M mills meet, one from the bottom, one from the top, will be a very slight step. And we're trying to get rid of that. So I'm going to hide that step in the transition of that chamfer to the outer wall. Hope that's clear. Tell me if it's not, and I'll go over it again. So what we've got here, um, in the essence of time, because we lost a bit of time, I'm going to skip to the one I made earlier, a bit like Blue Peter for any Brits watching. Um, and I'm going to talk through the parameters I've chosen why. So first thing I did was I did an adaptive path. You will notice that this is lower than everything I've just been talking about. So that's because there is a stock to leave placed on there. Stock to leave of 0.2. I'm confident that I won't be more than 0.2 out on the mismatch from op 10 to op 20. So I can put that 0.2 on there, machine round, and be happy that I won't see a witness mark from it. I chose an adaptive pass for this. I see a lot of people do this with a contour pass. Yes, it's okay, because you're only taking off a tiny bit of material, but you'll see here it just stops that wasted time. Because a contour pass would have had to have come up this side, around and back around again. Whereas the adaptive pass is clever enough to know it only needs one step over on the ends, and then two step overs on the front to back. I then got in with my contour pass, and I have gone exactly down to that level. That's because I can only afford to go down to there because I'm going to try and blend those mismatches in. I then did a drilling up, and I've drilled down to then tap these holes. So can anyone tell me why I have drilled first um, rather than done the pocket first, then drilled? So a little challenge out there. Does anyone know why I drilled them first? Because, of course, if I pocketed it, there's actually less to drill. So why did I opt to drill more? Let's hear your answers. Um, just so you know, because this might give you the answer, the drill is an 8.8, .8, .8, and I'm using an 8mm mill for the pocket. I might have given it away though a bit too much. Let's see if Spencer knows why I've done that order. Um, so let's have a quick look at this drilling op. Let's have a look at that. In my drilling op, in my heights, I've gone straight down to the whole bottom. So straight down, all the way to the whole bottom. Let's have a quick look at what that means. If I do a lovely section analysis here, let's choose that, and let's have a look at the section on my part. Um, you can see that I actually get problems here with them breaking through. It's going to be a fact of life on this fixture. I've only got 50 mil to play with, so uh, I'm going to have to live with it and make sure that I compensate for that. So I've got my drill here. What drill depth to bottom really means is the bottom of the parallel portion of the hole, i.e. this bit, is where the drill tip stops. But I've actually modelled this infusion with the drill tip going all the way down. So what I can do is if I come in here and go edit, I can tick this lovely thing called drill tip through bottom. And what it does then is make sure that the drill tip is actually at the bottom. It is at the bottom, everyone, but I'm just not banged on the centre line of the cut that I made. Uh, that's why you think it looks slightly different. So if you're shouting at me going, you're actually drilling more than the bottom, I'm not, I just haven't got the center line cut exactly right. Oh, forgive me, please. Um, so what we've got here then is our drill is right down to the base. I'm then doing my 2D pocket at the top. So Spence, have people got me the answer yet? I've got you an answer. Has no one else? We've got one uh, one comment, which is an interesting one, which is not what I thought. Uh, but Andrew said that it centres the hole with the pocket better if you drill it first. It centres the hole with the pocket better. Yeah, he's probably right. We're not going to get too much deflection in aluminium, but if it was harder materials, yeah, you are mm. right. It's, it's going to potentially give us problems there with deflection. So that's, that's, that's a good point. Didn't consider yeah. that. Yeah. And I, I think it's you drill it first so that you don't have to ramp. It's like Ooh. a pre-drill point, right? So you can put your tools straight in. 
you've, uh, you've, 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 you've been paying attention, Spence, not just uh, on these live streams. So, yeah, everyone knows that I hate ramping. Um, I always make a point that I try not to ramp. Doesn't do the tools much good and takes forever. So, exactly that. So, on our pocket, if we look here, I've set a pre-drill point at those four points. You can see them there. That means it's going to plunge straight the way down and then do a pocket out from there. That was exactly why I did it. I would rather use the drill to make holes. Drills are much better at making vertical holes than what end mills are. Then what I'm going to do then is I'm going to do a contour to contour these out. Um, and most importantly, in there, I am using compensation type as in control. These are H6 holes is what they need to be. And here is a Zeus book. Has anyone else got a Zeus book on the call? This was actually my dad's. Uh, manufacturing for me runs in the blood rather than, uh, rather than just an occupation. So there we have our limits and fits table, everyone. And I can see that a 16 mil hole at a H6 tolerance, so 10 to 8 range, here we go, H6 is um, plus zero minus 11 microns so that's quite a tight tolerance so i want to make sure that i'm using the cutter comp functions on the control to actually make sure that i get an accurate one so yeah anyone else got a zeus book out there mine when it was bought is the metric revision and it was one pound 60. Whoa. what do you know can't believe my dad gave me that for free I feel like you're about to mock me then, Spence. Uh, the Dizzy Heights of £1.60. <laughs> you've, you've come a long way since then, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Although it is ripped a little bit, so I probably didn't give him much for it. Anyway, I should stop talking and start fusioning. Um, what I'm doing then is I'm doing a chamfer pass. So these chamfers are not modelled in, um, but I want to make sure that there's a chamfer on that edge and that edge to make sure that the, the pins go in correctly. Um, I'll grab one of those in a second. Let me grab one now. That the pins go incorrectly, so these are what we fit into the bottom, everyone. These little pins. So I'm gonna put a nice chamfer so I can push that in easier. And then I'm gonna do a chamfer for the tapped hole. So does anyone know? Again, I love my little challenges. Why are we chamfering the tapped hole before we tap it? Questions, please, and answers. And then I'm running that chamfer around the outside. So um, let's post process this. Let's get it over to the machine tool. Let me grab my memory stick and we can then start the machine up because we're all there to watch the machine run rather than watch me babble on about my past experiences. So we're going to create an NC program. If you don't use NC programs, if you use the post processor dialog, please get into this century. It's a much nicer way of posting. You can see exactly what you are posting. And most importantly, it actually saves that in the NC programs um, node so you can see in future what did you post and when did you post and what toolpaths. It's better than the post process dialogue, in my opinion. Please try it, see what you think, let us know. Settings, let's call this 1010, nice and inventive name. Um, how are we getting on with the answer, Spence? Uh, a few suggestions to have a better entry, mm -hmm. to allow better centering. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all we've had in. You have to put us out of our misery, Rich. Do you reckon? Okay. So there's two reasons here. The first one everyone's got, it helps centre the tap as it goes in, rather than the tap hitting an edge and struggling, because you've got to think the way the taps are, depending on the type of tap you've got in there, um, you've actually got a case of where the flutes could slightly catch and, and pull themselves off. Um, we've got a fairly generous lead in on our taps. That's not going to happen, but it's good practice. And the second one that no one got um, is it's for burrs and for throwing off a burr. So what you've got to think of, if you tapped that first and then you ran the chamfer mill around it, you've got a chance of pushing a burr into the tapped edge so when you then try and screw it in you, the first thing you're trying to fight against is a burr on that very first thread because of course you're going to get some very thin points on that tapped and um, that trapezoid shape and rather than cutting it with a chamfer mill there's a chance it's going to fold it rather than cut it so if you chamfer it first then you tap it you know you're going to get no burrs 
in that uh, very first bit. And it's going to make sure that as soon as you tap it on the machine tool, you can screw the thread in straight away. How was that, Spence? Made a lot of sense. Made a lot of sense. Every day is a school day, you see? So uh, even I'm learning. Good, good. Right, everyone, let's jump over to this camera. I'm a bit big on that one. It's not, not a very flattering view. Sorry, everyone. So we're going to have a quick look at while I'm setting this up, and then we're going to jump to the camera that's in the side door over there. We've played about with the cameras this week um, off of some feedback we had before. So I've got 1010. I'm selecting that. Fixture up 10. Always check that it's the right NC program loaded. Um, had nearly had a near miss with that before. I always double check that I've put the right offset. G54, and that's got G54 in as well. I'm going to set my G54 up again. Although I'm happy with it, I want to make sure that everyone else sees exactly what I do. So there we go. Let's call our probe. So on our Hass, I'm going to go T31 ATC forward, which is to put the tool in the spindle. That could as easily have been T31 M6 cycle start on any other machine. Right, I'm going to move that into position. Um, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to be brave and I'm going to rapid it into the position that I know is right. Um, I'm going to move it down in Z. Would everyone out there rather see more machine stuff than fusion stuff? What do you reckon? We can happily tailor the future live streams um, to what you guys want. I'm going to do what we call the VPS cycles on our Haas, which effectively is called their, I think it's Visual Programming System, maybe. Um, I can't remember what that stands for. And it's a way of putting the probing cycles in at the machine tool. How's everyone feeling today, Spence? We've got some decent chat. A um, yeah, couple of comments about NC programs. Um, yep. EL started using them two days ago. Says super Ooh. cool. Saves him a lot of time. Um, Stuart Duncan has a, an interesting point. He says that NC programs doesn't pick up the comments in the setup. So ah, still interesting one. Processor, which is an interesting one. That'll be my task for this afternoon is to see if that's uh, if I can go work away around that, and if not, I'd be raised a ticket for it. Thank you for letting us know. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Right, so probing the X, set the X up, probing the Y, set the Y up, made sure I'm updating the right offset of G54, which I am. How are the cameras, everyone? Um, is it better than before? Um, what do we reckon? Do we prefer the setup we've got here with the camera in the side door? Hopefully it'll all come to light in a minute when we actually run with coolant on. You might get to see a bit more than what we did last time when it was just a, a door full of coolant. Right, I'm hand wheeling that out of the way. I once had a machine that I hit cycle start and the, it just plummeted down in Z. And that lives with me in fear every time I hit that green button. So that's why I've moved it out the way. I don't know, still to this day, don't know why it did it. Um, it broke a very expensive tool and I had a very embarrassing conversation with the uh, managing director at the time. Um, right, so there we go. There's our face mall coming in. Right, my golden rule, what is it, Spence, when I'm machining? Where, where's the crash most likely to happen? Put me on the spot here, Rich. Uh, in the first move. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you like to put me on the spot. It was my turn to get a bit of payback on it then. Yeah, you've caught me out there. I'll get you back. Don't worry about that. Right, everyone, yeah, so the crash is most likely to happen on the first move. Most likely you've got a datum set wrong, you've got a, a tool set wrong, um, and it's going to happen there. I always inch it in. My, my, my sort of ethos is expect it to be wrong and you'll be pleasantly surprised if it's not. Um, but yeah, again, I've got the luxury of not being against the clock here while I'm doing this. So um, I'd rather be safe than, uh, than save a bit of time. How's that looking, Spence, on the camera? We, uh, is it a nice view with the uh, camera in that position? Oh, yeah. Looks great. Real uh, nice. Brilliant, everyone. Yep, so we're doing our, uh, our facing across there as we go along. Um, I think I've got like a 3 mil step down on there. So it's going to do a uh, two 3 mil passes, and then it's going to do a finishing pass on there. So while that's machining, let's jump back to Fusion. Um, and I'm going to talk about some more, because as much as I'd love to just sit and watch machining all day long, um, we unfortunately can't. So, right, let's have a quick look what we've got here. So, right... 
we have got our setup five. So this is our op 20. Let's uh, let's get rid of these ones and let's rename that so we all know what's going on. So let's rename that. Uh, Fitch op 20. So we can see here that it's going to be this way up. And the ops that I've put on first is a nice facing op to go across the top. Let's have a quick look at how that's going to look on our machine. Really nice thing on here is something called use even step downs. I've got five millimeters of material on the top of there. And I'm going to do a little finishing step down. But if I set that at, at two millimeters and hit OK, what you might find, I think two millimeters might not be enough. Let's, uh, let's put four millimeters on there. What I'm trying to get done is I'm trying to get uneven step downs to happen. But unfortunately, I've obviously got numbers that work nicely with everything. So what you can get is, I haven't got enough stock on the top to show that, but what you can get is a scenario where the you've got your little finishing step down, you've then got a three millimeter, a three millimeter, and then a one millimeter, because that's all it can fit in the gap. But what you can do is tick use even step downs here and that will look at the the top to the bottom of the cut and it will split it up so the step over is no greater than your maximum step down so the step down not step over the step down is no greater than the maximum step down there a really nice tool when it just helps make even cuts rather than having like a one mil step down then a three a three and a three it would even those out and you'd get what a a 2.8, a 2.8, a 2.8, and a 2.8, or something like that. My maths isn't good enough to quickly work that out. Have you ever used that one before, Spence? The even step downs? Yeah. Uh, yeah, interesting enough. I had a few conversations with a few customers asking for that functionality in some of our other toolpaths. Um, if anybody would be interested in that, let's hear in the chat. Would you like even step downs for maybe some of the 3D roughing strategies? I think I'd like it on 2D contour. Yeah, I think I'd like it on 2D Contour, because I've had it before with 2D Contour, where it does like a, you know, like a 10 mil step down, a 10 mil step down, then a 1 mil step down. So, I think it'd be quite useful there. Oh, there's a knock on the machine, then I thought something would crash, but it hadn't. Right, everyone, so, let me just quickly stop that, and let's flip back to the big camera. Oh, that was worrying then. Someone dropped a box earlier, and uh, Ian over on the DMU nearly fell over when he thought it was his, uh, his machine. Right. So, bear in mind, Ian on the DMU over there has currently got a one and a half meter long turning tool down inside of a cylinder. So, he's quite literally just running that machine blind at the moment. Right, enough about him. Let's have a quick look at this. We've got our drill. So, we've got our drill now. Oh, no, sorry, this is our drill. This is our 10 millimeter end mill doing that adaptive pass around the outside. Getting ahead of myself there. So there we go, we've got that 10 mil mill going round. We can see it's going to do the one full circuit round the part, and then it's going to come back and then just take the extra stock off those other edges on there. So that's a nice reason why I'd use adaptive in this scenario rather than using 2D contour with two um, lots of step overs. So there we go, it's doing the little second cut there, and then it will do the second cut on the other side as well. Lovely. Perfect. Do we have any feedback, Spence, if people want to see more on Machine or more Fusion or what do they prefer? Not much feedback. Uh, Stuart wants to see more Fusion. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, somebody else tried NC programs. Um, didn't like it as much as post processors. So maybe we've got some work to do there. Yeah, definitely. Um, plus one for even step downs everywhere. So maybe we're onto something, Rich. Yeah, this could be a nice one. So we've got our drilling up, everyone. Now, I do like watching a bit of drilling. It's uh, it's satisfyingly quick, normally, drilling is. Um, the trick with drilling is to get your chip breaking right. Um, there's still a 16mm M mill in here that eludes me. I'm struggling to get that to chip break right, but I'm not I'm not a material expert. I'm nowhere near good enough to get it, uh, getting it chip breaking properly. I've got all the others going well, though. Right, here we go. Those four holes drilling in nicely. So there is something called peck drilling that you can do, which is effectively where it just keeps pecking into the surface and going down. 
depends on the material, depends on the size of drill, depends on the depth of hole as well. Um, so you've got a couple of options in, we're doing a nice straight cut down into aluminium here. We don't need to do pet drilling. <gasps> But well, we can see there the uh, the end mill plunges straight in. It always is a bit unnerving, but that's the whole point of doing that pre-drill operation first, is that it goes in and it, it uh, plunges straight down rather than ramping or having to feed down. Right, we've done the uh, the pocket operation. Now we're going to go and do that 2D contour, and it's going to use the cutter comp and hopefully make them bang on for us. I did set up the cutter comp just right yesterday uh, for a different job, so. I'm not going to uh, redo it again today. Quick question for you, Rich. Go for it. Ex can you explain again why you did chose to use the adaptive over the 2D contour? Yeah, basically, it only needed um, it only needed two passes on the front to back and one pass on the left to right. So if I'd have gone 2D contour, it would have put two passes on the left and right and two passes on the front and back. So it just saved a little bit of time. Um, You'd argue that that wasn't really enough to warrant a, a change if you're happy with a 2D contour. But imagine if that was quite a bit different. You know, sometimes when we buy stock material in, um, you know, this was quite good. It had, I think it had two millimeters on the one edge and one millimeters on the other two edges. But imagine if you've got like 10 millimeters over on the one side and one millimeter over on the other, you're going to have all those empty passes and all that air cutting time going around the other other ones. So again, it would probably show up more in a different case scenario, but I just wanted to highlight that, that is something that you might need to consider. Brilliant, thanks, good explanation. Right, we're gonna do some tapping in a second. A question for everyone in the chat. What is the difference between a spiral flute tap and a spiral point tap? I want your answer on this as well, Spence. <laughs> Spence is Googling it away crazily. Right, tapping is always a bit nervous. I don't like tapping because if you snap a tap, you've uh, you've got yourself an hour's worth of pain. Right, there we go. One thing to make sure when you're tapping is to make sure you've got a nice amount of coolant on there. Um, I'm going to show you some of my tapping top tips on my TTTs um, in Fusion in a second, just to make sure that you hopefully don't get a snapped tap in there as well. There we go. This will be our last op. Let's lift that up. And there we go. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. So let's quickly jump back into Fusion and me. Go on, Spence. What does people think about spiral point versus spiral flute tapping? No, nothing. No, no, nobody knows. Oh, here we go. Uh, swarf up versus swarf down. Correct. Correct. Right. So a spiral flute tap is what I've got here. Let's grab this out and show everyone. So, this is our spiral flute tap. If I go the right way, you can see there that the flutes on there are spiral. They're helix flutes. What that's going to do is, is effectively when it cuts the, the thread, the swarf comes out the thread, hits that angled wall, and shoots up. So because the flutes are turning around, if it was a flat wall, it would hit it and either go up or down. You've got a 50-50 chance of one way or the other. But because that wall is pointed back, as the swarf comes into that flute, it hits it and goes up, making sure the swarf comes up out of the, uh, out of the hole. So that's spiral point. Spiral flute. Sorry, that's spiral flute. Spiral point um, is a straight-sided tap where the point of it is spiraled in the opposite direction. So when it starts cutting, it hits that and pushes it down instead. Simple. Easy, nice one between the two. Spiral point, spiral flute. You've got to look at your application and go, do I want the swarf to come up out the hole or down through the hole? Different applications call for different reasons. Um, I'm not enough of a machinist to be able to go through all the pros and cons between them. I just know what they do. Did anyone else get that one, Spence? A couple of people. Oh, yeah, a couple well. of people. I guess it depends if your hole's the through hole, right? Yeah. If, you, if you're a machine of through hole, you want the swarf to go, you can, the swarf can go through. Yeah, whereas... exactly. You can, can go through. Whereas if it's not, you need to come back out. Exactly. 
Right, lovely. So, um, my tapping top tips that I showed everyone. So, my drilling here, I drilled down to the bottom of the hole. I then tapped, and you've got to make sure you do this properly, is you have your height, and then I've come back up three and a half millimetres. So, what I've done here is that I effectively looked at what was the minimum amount of thread I could get away with on this component. Um, and that was three and a half millimetres back up from the bottom. But you then have to consider as well the amount of lead in teeth that you're going to effectively be missing on your tap. So effectively what you've got is the first one, two, three, whatever size lead in you've got, the teeth or the, the pitch of the, the tap as well, those will not be fully formed threads. So a screw will not be able to go into them. So you've got to consider um, the fact that you don't want to bottom the tap out in the hole because you'll probably snap your tap doing that. And then you've also got to look at, though, is that you won't actually have a full thread at those bottom few teeth. It will be slightly higher. So, and also, again, remember the chamfering top tip. That as well goes into that little category of my tapping top tips. How's everyone doing, Spence? Have we got uh, anything more before we start to look at wrapping this session up? No, no more, no more feedback on the chat. Last chance, if you have any questions, let us hear them. Yeah. Right, everyone. So what I'm going to do now, um, I, I wish I could show you the machine and the whole of this, but I haven't got enough time. I'm just going to talk through about some of the operations that I've done on here. So I have faced the top off. Um, quite obviously. Um, and then I've got to have a real big think about the order that I do things in here now. So I've done a drilling op to clear out all these corners. Because if I was to do a pocket operation and remove all this pocket and then try and drill that hole, the chances are my drill is going to wander and snap. So I've made sure that I drill first, as we see all here, all these lovely drilling ops drill down, and then I'm going to do the pocketing operations. Similar to before, on these holes, I have chosen to drill them all the way out from the top down to also allow myself on this portion. Um, these are okay because I can enter from the side here, but on these pockets, I can't enter from the side, so I need a pre-drill proportion to go down into and then move out from. So what I want to show as well is this pre-drill we did here. So let's go into drilling. I'm going to choose that hole there. I'm going to go select same diameter. I'm going to choose my tool of HASVF2. I'm going to filter it by hole making, filter it by drilling, filter it or sort it by diameter, and click on the M4 pilot. So there, go. So there are all of the 3.3 mil diameter holes on my component, which is perfect. But they're all going to be now under the same strategy. Um, one thing I do need to do, though, I need to tick drill tip through bottom. That's going to make sure it goes right down into there. But you can see that these are a different depth to those. If I wanted to peck drill those, but normal drill those, what I could do is click only at the same depth. And what that's going to do is look across my components. You can see here it's picked up these holes. Those holes are all at the same depth. So I could select those. I could duplicate that. Let's edit. Let's run back. Let's choose the deeper set of holes. And then let's peck drill those. Um, chip breaking, partial retract. There we go. So I've now got two strategies um, with very few clicks. Because, of course, if I wanted to do this slightly differently, um, I'd be having problems where I'd want to peck drill some, not peck drill others, and how would I split the two operations up? So that's, uh, where are we again? That same hole depth is a really nice way um, of making sure that you've only got the same depth holes included when you go select same diameter. So yeah, really nice way. Um, that's all I'm going to want to cover today. Let's cover people's questions now. How are we looking, Spence? Yeah, uh, we got a suggestion for an upcoming live stream, which is Let's always nice. Uh, Stuart wants to know, or wants us to show at some point, how to set up stock from the preceding operation for op 20, and more importantly, for op 30. Okay, that's an interesting one. I will investigate, have a look, and we'll get back. 
Uh, that seems to be it on the questions. Don't forget, if you like the video, give it a like. There's uh, 55, 56 people watching and 15 likes. So there's some people out there not hitting that like button. Uh, if you like the live streams, why not subscribe? And when you press subscribe, don't forget to hit that little bell. And if you hit the bell, then you'll be notified every time we have a live stream. So you'll never miss a live stream again. How about that, Rich? Yeah, most importantly, when we mess up the audio, um, you're notified again when we restart the live stream. Absolutely. <laughs> Hopefully so, we won't mess up the audio next Yeah, time. I still have not got a clue what went on there. But anyway, <laughs> so thanks, everyone. Um, if the fixturing components arrive in time, we'll be taking this off again next week. We'll be able to finish machining the fixture, and we'll be actually looking at the toolpath on the component and how we have held the component and then machine the components as well. We'll be looking at component patterns as will be the sort of the focus of next week and how to get that right. Thanks everyone. Beautiful. Lots of people can't wait. One thing I would say just before we go, uh, don't forget to check out part one yes, of, of the series, it. which we'll link in the description below. So check that out. Perfect. Brilliant. Thanks very much everyone. Really appreciate you sticking with us again. Um, we enjoy the live streams. We hope you do too. And see you all again soon. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody.